Welcome everybody to the April 16th, 2021 edition of the Employer Handbook Zoom Office Hour. My name is Eric Meyer. I am an employment lawyer at Fisher Broyles. I'll drop links to all my connecting stuff, also the law firm bio and LinkedIn and all that stuff. I'm also, surprise, surprise, the publisher of the Employer Handbook blog at theemployerhandbook.com. Welcome everyone. Today we're gonna to be talking about the next wave of employment law lawsuits that we see coming in 2021. And I am so fortunate to have with me Lori Ecker, who's been so generous with her time. Now, folks, be gentle. She is an employee rights attorney. She's the one who's going to be on the other side of the V suing you if you mess up, all right? So we're going to get all the secrets, all the inside dirt, everything we can possibly get to remain compliant and not end up in court opposite Lori because she is darn good. Lori, welcome. How are you doing today? Welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Lori Ecker. I am a solo practitioner in Chicago. I represent employees exclusively in their individual discrimination, retaliation, and other types of employment law issues. I'm also on the American Arbitration Association's employment roster as an arbitrator and a mediator. And I've also been increasing um, my practice in the area of uh, neutral workplace investigations. That sounds like fun. We were just talking about that before we, we started. Um, Zoom, Zoom investigations, I guess for the foreseeable future seem to be the way to go. Anyway, welcome folks. We're glad to have you here. Again, if you have questions as we go along, just use the chat feature on the bottom. And uh, if you don't have questions, just sit back, relax, and enjoy as two lawyers who are not your lawyers dispense non-legal advice that doesn't create any sort of attorney-client privilege with any of us. That's the deal. If you need actual legal advice, don't get it from a free Zoom. That's terrible. Okay, don't do that. Call your outside counsel. Pay him or her to give you some answers, some real answers to some actual questions with specific facts and all that stuff. They'll say it depends. That's what they do. It's okay. We're going to say it depends also, but get your legal advice from them, okay? If you have questions that you post in the chat window, we're going to assume that they're hypothetical and you're asking them for a friend. And don't worry, folks. We only know your name. We don't know what company you're with. So Lori's not taking copious notes. Like, oh, I better sue that company. So don't worry about it, okay? I, at least I don't think she is. <laughs> but anyway, let's get started. So, Lori, shout out real quickly. Shout out to Jackson Lewis, um, who posted recently, I'm going to drop this in the chat right now, a survey, or at least a, a kind of an analysis of recent lawsuit trends. So before we get to what's on the horizon, let's talk about what the first quarter of 2021 has looked like in terms of employment lawsuits, okay? Whether COVID related or not. So here are some of the statistics from the Jackson Lewis report. Top five states with COVID-19 employment complaints. Who wants to take a, who wants to take a guess at number one? Just throw it in the chat. What do you think? Who's number one? What state? There we go. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You are right. <laughs> it's not Texas. Who said Texas? Get the heck out of here. <laughs> it's California. California, number one. What's number two? Said pet, so a lot of people saying New York. A lot, a lot, a lot of, oh, here it comes. Now people are getting it right. It's not New York. It's New Jersey. New Jersey's number two. California and New Jersey have combined for 42% of all of the, I guess these are the COVID related um, employment complaints in the first quarter of 2021. And part of that I believe is because you can go right to state court, at least in New Jersey, uh, not a California lawyer, I assume you can too, 
without really exhausting any sort of administrative remedy. So I think that has something to do with it. Um, and what we're seeing is a trend or a continuing trend towards utilizing the state courts. As you know, folks, um, if you have a federal discrimination claim, Title VII, uh, age under the ADEA, a disability discrimination claim under the ADA, uh, you've got to exhaust your administrative remedies. In plain English, got to file an EEOC charge. So that takes time. Uh, in states like New Jersey, you don't have, Ohio's another one of those states, you don't have to do that. You can forego the federal stuff and just go right to court on your state law claims, which are at least as good, if not better, than what you can get under, under federal law. So that's why we're probably seeing uh, a big, push towards state law litigation. Lori, would it shock you that the number one <laughs> type of complaint, 83% of complaints that are COVID related in the first quarter involve some allegation of wrongful termination, but that shocked you at all? Not at all. No. <laughs> what are some of the things that you've been seeing in the first quarter, whether anecdotally or empirically, um, in terms of you know, the types of the types of employment claims we've been seeing so far, COVID related. Yeah, I mean, I think to the extent that they're COVID related, it are situations where people have been furloughed, people are being terminated as a result of you know, a re reorganization or layoffs. Um, nothing directly related to COVID, such as employers requiring uh, their employees to be vaccinated before returning to work or something like that. But, you know, just typically the typical you know, discrimination and retaliation claims that you would see in any type of reorganization layoff situation. Yeah, and, and that's foreshadowing one of the tips we're gonna have later on, which is not so much when you're laying people off, but really as we return people to work, take a careful look at how you're going about doing that. You know, are you presumably not intentionally, but unintentionally excluding a protected class or are some of your lesser HR colleagues and, and maybe folks that businesses that don't have HR, you know, shame on them. Are they stereotyping? Are they saying, you know, oh, we got some older people. I don't know how that's going to work or, you know, or um, Cynthia is pregnant gosh, we can't bring her back into the workplace with everything that's going on for, for, for her safety and the safety of the unborn child. Yeah, you just bit off a Pregnancy Discrimination Act claim. So be careful about how you're evaluating both the furloughs and the layoffs, but hopefully more so the return to work because we want you guys back and working and, and, and avoiding the discrimination claims. Um, who are the targets so far? Um, where, is, where are the claims being filed? 25% in the first quarter have targeted the healthcare industry. Um, why does that make sense? Well, I guess that's where people are really, you know, have their jobs. I mean, most people in the, in the healthcare industry have maintained their jobs. A lot of people are in the workplace. Uh, they could be claims relating to workplace safety. They could be more traditional I suppose you know, your hostile work environment, your regular discrimination claims, whatever you know you would otherwise see um, from working with one another, could also have to do with accommodations uh, relating to COVID or FMLA, of course. So I basically just said everything. Um, but I think the nexus there is that folks are in the workplace working, um, so that might lead to uh, a, a bigger number of claims. Next up is 13% of complaints against retail and consumer goods. Lori, are you seeing any particular industries that are having trouble dealing with kind of employment law compliance in a, or HR compliance in a COVID environment? Not a particular industry. I, I think that you're right, absolutely, that people who are actually physically reporting to work are the individuals who are going to you know, be more susceptible to the claims that have been filed um, and of other people who are working remotely, some of them can just be off the radar and not you know, 
They're not engaging in face-to-face -face interactions with their coworkers or their supervisors. And so there's a, a little bit of a buffer, I think. Yeah. And that, although that can come back and bite you later on, <clears throat> wage an hour. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that <laughs> later well, on. And also, it can be a problem because what's the alternative, right? Is putting things in writing? Yes. I love putting things in writing. Right. This is this is true. This is true. I assume you've gotten some very nice exhibit A's uh, in your in your time, whether it's a email or more likely text message, Slack, instant message, stuff like that. So along those lines and piggybacking on the big claim so far, right? Wrongful termination. Let's assume next week, Lori, you get a call from someone who says, I found you online, you know, you, you're, you're the person, you know, everyone knows Lori Ecker uh, in, in the Chicagoland area. Um, I think I have a wrongful termination claim. I need your help. I want you to sue my employer. What are some of the questions that you're asking this person in order to vet whether they have a claim? Well, <laughs> Did I put you on the spot? No, I think the problem is, is that with a lot of employees, I rarely get the chance to ask questions. <laughs> In there. It's like they have a story to tell and damn it, they're going to tell it. And, you know, if I'm able to interject some questions along the way, um, all the more. Uh, but, you know, initially, I want to certainly know who the employer is so that I make sure that I don't have any uh, conflict of interest. Um, and kind of get a better idea of what industry they're in. I want to know how long they've been working there. You know, the, there's a lot of misconceptions and you know, wrong information that employees get. They think they know what employment at will means, and, and they certainly don't. Um, they think they know what hostile work environment means, and they certainly don't. And, you know, surprising to me, um, and I've seen it a lot more, I think, in the last year or so, is individuals who have only been employed by the employer for a few months and think they have an age discrimination claim. Oh, because when they were hired six months ago, they, what, they somehow went through a time machine in the interim and got a lot older. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. But I would imagine disability could be a, a hot one. Um, especially for newer hires, pregnancy, um, potentially wage an hour. What do you think? Yeah, I don't really handle wage and hour issues um, as much as just kind of flagging them and knowing enough to understand that they, they may have a claim that I can refer to someone else. But yeah, I think, you know, what I've seen a lot of is um, the just confusion uh, around public teachers um, in the Chicago area, uh, not only the Chicago Teachers Union, but other um, districts throughout the Chicago area. And just, you know, the confusion as to, you know, when the school districts went from being purely uh, virtual to being hybrid and then trying to transition into 100% everyone's at work. And the, I think one of the biggest concerns and it are individuals who are living with um, individuals who are most at risk mm -hmm. for um, COVID. And if they're not um, engaging in day-to-day -day care of the individual such that there might be some type of an FMLA um, coverage. It gets a little dicey as to you know, whether the individual has any real protection under the law um, to say, I, I need to work virtually because I live with someone who is at high risk. Right. And then right. I get into a, a deeper issue with FMLA of employers who during remote work might fail to provide the notice of FMLA rights. But even if you fail to provide the notice, and I blogged, I think I blogged about one of these cases recently, or maybe I, I meant to blog about it. Unless the 
individual suffers any actual harm, then there's, and it's no harm, no foul. So if someone is able to, well, if someone's able to work remotely, then they don't, probably don't need the FMLA, but, but if they need the time off to care for a loved one and you don't provide the notice, I mean, hopefully you're providing it, but nonetheless, they're able to care for their loved one and they get restored to their position once the need to care for that loved one is over, then the fact that you didn't provide them with an FMLA notice, it, yeah, technical violation, but it's not a lawsuit because they weren't harmed in any way. They get their, you know, they, they got time off, they get restored to their job, they get the same salary and benefits, yada, yada. But that's something where, you know, could easily get messed up if someone isn't restored to their existing position or doesn't get the same salary and benefits or gets furloughed or, or whatever it is. Um, the failure to provide that FMLA notice is, is just, it's kind of, it's an in. It's an in to, to potentially bring an action against you. So you know, be careful with that. Uh, so wrongful termination, I suspect, is going to be a big one still going forward, um, whether it's part of a furlough or not being brought back to work and effectively terminated when others are outside of that protected class are brought back. Um, Failure to accommodate under the ADA and Pregnancy Discrimination Act, state law, going to be a big one as well, I think. Um, and in particular, Lori, how about mental health issues, anxiety, um, depression. stress, depression? Yeah, I was just reading on the internet that um, a 2020 study from the Journal of the American Medical Association Network reported that COVID-19 has tripled the rate of depression in adults from all demographics. Oh, geez. And you know, the problem is, is that a, a lot of people are not seeking professional help and they're um, self-medicating. Mm. Which, you know, which, which leads to even bigger, I didn't mean to step on you there, but, but alcoholism is, is in and of itself a disability. Now, use of illegal drugs is not, um, but, but alcoholism- A history of use of illegal absolutely, drugs? Absolutely, absolutely. Record, sure, record of, absolutely. So these are multi-layered issues for employers. Now, some of the advice from the EEOC, I don't think you can go wrong with this, is to be proactive and, and, and as you're anticipating having folks return to work, asking them, like almost uniformly, right? Not just the folks that you reasonably believe maybe may have a disability, but everyone. Hey, as we transition to return to work, if there's something that we can do to assist you, to, to make your job easier, to, to you know facilitate that transition back to work, whatever it may be, let us know, right? And if you want to take it the next step and say, look, if, if you're dealing with stress, anxiety, mental health issues, anything like that, that you feel would impair you from coming back to the workplace, please let us know so that we can talk about it with you so that we can work out some sort of an accommodation. Do you have any issue with that, Lori? Well, it probably is a situation where be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Yeah, there's that, I suppose. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I, I think at this point, judges are going to be, and juries especially, are going to be sympathetic to people who are dealing with stress of coming back to work. And even if it's not a technical disability, right, There could be regarded as situations. I mean, COVID itself, for example, the EEOC has said, has been asked, is COVID-19 a disability? And basically it's like, it depends, right? How serious is the COVID? How long lasting is the COVID? That the longer, the more serious, now we're talking actual disability. But if someone, you know, has kind of the, the lighter or asymptomatic COVID, 
you could still be regarded as disabled, right? And then if the COVID triggers, and I'm not trying to put on my medical hat here, so I may be speaking out of turn, but if it exacerbates other existing disabilities, right? Maybe it heightens someone's stress and anxiety, right? So then you have an issue where someone is actually disabled and needs an accommodation in order to be able to perform the essential functions of the job. So keep an open mind. Uh, to Lori's point, be careful what you ask for, but um, the alternative is uh, if you don't accommodate and someone or someone feels as if they've been wrong, you're going to be defending that, that piece of litigation. Um, how about pregnancy? Something that Lori, I, I think it slipped under the radar a little bit with the EEOC as we focus on kind of disability accommodation, but also there would be a duty to accommodate. Pregnancy itself is not a disability, but, but I, I imagine there's gotta be a duty to accommodate something COVID related to pregnancy, right? As long as you're doing something for others who are similarly situated, others who are similarly situated in their ability or inability to work. Have I said that right, basically? Yeah, right. I mean, that's pregnancy issues are issues that all employers in all different shapes and sizes are continuing to grapple with, um, regardless of whether we're in the COVID-19 situation or not. I, I, the one issue that I think is going to probably um, be more prevalent are situations where you know women have been able to return to active work remotely um, without worrying about childcare issues um, and things of that nature. That once there's an order that people are to return to work, may cause some friction. So you've got a double edged sword. You have the sex plus claims. So are the people with children being treated better than people without children or vice versa? And then on the other hand, if you treat them worse, now you're getting into a, a stereotyping type claim. Um, so the best way to do it, I suppose, is to just treat everyone the same and let individuals raise issues or raise concerns with you on a case by case basis as you're restoring people to the workplace. That is to say, don't presuppose that someone's childcare issues are going to impair them from doing their job. Um, but at the same time, certainly open the door to the possibility of FFCRA leave. You know, if, if, if you're still doing that, that's, that's available or maybe state law, um, there's no duty to accommodate um, someone for their children under the ADA or the FMLA, unless that the child's sick. Um, but certainly recognize that those those are some possibilities to allow um, parents to to care for their children. Telework versus regular attendance. I've been blogging about this a lot recently in the, in the, in the context, Lori, of pre-COVID cases, right? When someone says, usually if the employee says, I can't come to work, I've got this condition, I've got a disability, it's clear that the person has a disability, maybe they've exhausted their FMLA, I can't come to work, I need to telework. And, you know, sometimes the employer, usually, actually, usually the fact pattern is the employer tries it out and it doesn't take, it doesn't work. And then the rubber hits the road. Is regular attendance an essential function of the job? Has that analysis changed or do you think it's going to change going forward as we account for COVID? Are courts going to recognize that lo and behold, people are functional when they work remotely and, and, and err more on the side of allowing people to work remotely as an accommodation? What do you think? Well, here in the Seventh Circuit, for instance, there's been, I think, real judicial issue with 
employer's right to say that showing up for work is an essential function of the job. Um, I'm hoping that once the age of the Seventh Circuit judiciary continues to decrease, that we might have a little bit better luck um, with the arguments. And I also think that, yeah, I mean, employers during COVID said, no problem, you know, we're going to keep our business running and all of you people are going to work remotely from home. So how are they going to make an undue hardship argument <laughs> when individuals need to continue to work from home when they've done so successfully for the last 14 months. It, how far can you get into that? Going back to my hypothetical before where someone calls you on the phone and now we're talking about an accommodation situation, right? You're, you're deciding whether to take this person on as a client. Knowing that the employers say so as to what an essential function is or isn't is given, I'd say significant weight by courts. How are you vetting those types of claims? The, the telecommuting, remote work as a reasonable accommodation case? Well, unfortunately, usually I only get those calls after they've been terminated. Oh, uh, okay. So you've got a retaliation claim at least. <laughs> right. So it's been, I haven't had the opportunity to try to engage in the interactive process. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, there, the, you know, the key, just within any discrimination claim, right, the, the key focus is on the employer's reason. And, you know, if it's because we can't accommodate that security wise, because, you know, um, our systems don't allow for us to, you know, have people work from home, there's just too much risk that our systems are going to be hacked from their home Wi-Fi programs, things like that. If, you know, if, if that's the real reason, then I think they've got a problem, right? Because that's what we've been doing for the last 12 months or so. And if they didn't do anything to make sure that their employees' Wi-Fi systems were security you know, free and, you know, you know not going to have any uh, real serious issues with that, then I, I think they're going to have some problems with you know, making the claim that they're unable to accommodate someone's request to work from home. This is a great time to update the job descriptions in anticipation of having folks come back to work. And don't just, I'm speaking, I'm preaching to the choir here. You all know this. You're not just doing this yourself. This is not HR's job to just update job descriptions in a vacuum because that makes no sense. I mean, you don't know what folks are doing on a day-to-day. -day. I preached this before. It makes sense, it, it, it not like kudos to Eric. I mean, I didn't make this up, but talking to not just managers, but the employees themselves to find out what they're doing on a day-to-day, -day. Um, what truly are the important functions of the job as things have changed during COVID and as you anticipate, the company anticipates them to continue to change as we report back to work. So memorializing that in a job description with a specific section that says, these are the essential functions of the job. Regular attendance, boom. Um, you know, being able to lift something, boom. Whatever it is, um, list those under essential functions of the job. And then bonus points, give it to the employee. <laughs> Even more bonus points, have them sign off on it then you've got exhibit A. And as long as you follow that and you, you, know, you treat people fairly and, and, and you, you hew to the letter of the, of, the, of the job description, you're gonna be in pretty good shape. Uh, so that's, you know, that's another thing that you can do going forward. Uh, Lori, there was a question. You mentioned the study. Do you have a link to that study by chance that you could add to the chat window? I think I probably locate that. Yeah. Perfect. Doesn't have to be this second. Um, there was another question. Tina asked thoughts on an eligibility notice versus a designation notice here. So the eligibility notice, I think, is the most important thing just to recognize that there's an FMLA issue. I mean, once you've done that, hopefully the other dominoes will fall into place. But just advising employees that they have this right 
under the FMLA to take 12, up to 12 weeks off in a 12 month period, whether they're working remotely or they're in the workplace. I think that's important um, because that, you know, that's where we, we, we fall down the most. In terms of the designation notice, I, it's, it's pretty much same as it ever was, except for, right? We have Teladocs who, telemedicine, which can basically get someone over the hump to having a serious health condition. So it used to be, you, know, you have to go to the ER, spend a night there, or have an ongoing course of care with a doctor where you know, basically you're seeing that person, you're seeing that, that, that physician in person. Now it can be uh, telemedicine. Uh, for the foreseeable future, telemedicine is going to count as, as part of ongoing care. So just be open, open to that. Let's see, we had another question come up. Um, another question for job descriptions, any recommendations for sites that will offer examples, ideas for BFOQs? Oh, it's because I blogged about this recently. We do not have those specifics on our job description and have found lately that it may need to be in addition to our job descriptions. All right, so a BFOQ is a bona fide occupational qualification. Basically what that is in plain English is we need a certain protected class for a certain job. So the classic one was, uh, oh, Lori, I'm going to take you off mute just because otherwise I don't think you're going to be able to mute. You're going to be able to unmute. Let's see. Go ahead, try and unmute now, Lori. I had a noisy garbage truck outside, so. <laughs> Perfect. That's okay. Um, so with BFOQs, it, the classic one was you needed to be of Asian descent or, or Chinese to work at a Chinese restaurant. That was the classic one, right? Or um, you needed to be, uh, I'm, not, I'm not thinking of, of other great examples, but other, other, other companies tried to get a little bit too liberal with this, okay? Like I think it was Southwest Airlines, the Love Airlines, a BFOQ was having these beautiful students, beautiful flight attendants. You had to be, you know, female flight attendant. Doesn't doesn't necessarily work. Race can never be a bona fide occupational qualification. Someone emailed me and they said, "Well, what do you mean race can never be a BFOQ, Eric? What if they make the Jackie Robinson movie? Doesn't the person who played Jackie Robinson have to be black?" I said, "Well, you know, I thought to myself, well, it's not a BFOQ, but they're going to hire the most." suitable person for the role, and odds are that person's going to be black, okay? You're not going to have an issue with a white person saying, I was discriminated against because they didn't let me play Jackie Robinson. That person's probably not going to be the best suited for the role. So it's not technically a BFOQ, but in acting gigs, when you're playing real life historical figures, yeah, it makes sense to have someone of the same race play that individual. It's usually the way it works. Yeah, that issue got raised in the theater arena with Hamilton and a number of other plays after that. And I think, you know, one thing that you need to remember is that most actors are not employees. Right. They just sign a contract, <laughs> but they're not employees and they're generally not going to be covered by Title VII. And, you know, the courts are going to give producers and directors their artistic freedom to do whatever casting they want to do. Yeah. So jumping off of, well, let's, let's, let's do a reset because we're at 1230. Folks, I'm Eric. That's my special guest, Lori Ecker. She is one of my favorite employee rights attorneys based out of the Chicago area. One of my favorite employee rights attorneys in the country, but she happens to be based out of the Chicago area. We're talking about litigation trends and the types of lawsuits we expect to see in the second half of 20 or last three quarters of 2021. We're not, we're lawyers, but we're not your lawyers. We're not giving legal advice, that whole thing. That's the disclaimer. And we were just talking about telework versus regular attendance. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about something that I alluded to earlier, and that is stereotyping and how uh, personally, I think that's going to be a a source of um, litigation for the rest of 2021. Like 
the lowest hanging fruit, pregnant workers, older workers, and not bringing them out back to work or removing them from the workplace because of this perceived notion that someone who's older is, th their health could be compromised if they're in the workplace or someone who's pregnant, their health could be compromised in the workplace. I mean, from your vantage point, you get a potential client or an actual client like that, Lori, that's, that's a quick settlement, right? That's an easy one. Well, not necessarily. I've got an EEOC chart on file right now for an older woman who was furloughed and learned that a number of her retail colleagues were um, performing their job duties remotely, and she wasn't asked to do that. And then ultimately, um, she was let go, um, and they hired someone to replace her, essentially, is what we're arguing. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of that going on, and unfortunately, um, they don't always settle very quickly, depending on the sophistication of the organization and whether they've been sued before and understand uh, the productivity and costs and other issues that are involved in litigation. Lori, how much did you get into looking at um, the severance agreement that someone's given you, a potential client has given you that they, you know, are thinking about signing but haven't signed yet? And do you see employers botch the, for, I'm thinking for older employees, like the 21 day uh, period, the seven day revocation period, or if it's a, or if it's a layoff, a bigger layoff that they don't include the um, 45 day time period or the matrix that goes on the back of an OWBPA release. Do you see that a fair amount? Yeah, the latter most um, commonly is that they treat, you know, a multiple termination situation as a single termination situation. And, you know, they're just using, you know, I'm sure none of the attendees have this issue, but a, a lot of organizations just use the forms, you know, the templates that they've used in the past and don't really understand that if, you know, a number of individuals are being let go at the same time, then they need to, you know, shift gears and give the 45 day notice and give the exhibit A and you know, provide additional information that you don't need in a single termination situation. Exactly. And it's not to say, folks, that if you forget to do it, that you've discriminated against someone based on their age. I mean, you could have perfectly legitimate business reasons for terminating someone who's over the age of 40 as part of a reduction in force. But the idea is, is that you provide this notice, this Exhibit A, to your release, which identifies the decisional unit, um, essentially in plain English, the, the, the classification of folks who are affected by the layoff. You know, job titles, departments, things like that. And you list out the ages of the people who were kept and the people who weren't. So that someone who is presumably over 40 could look at this and go, hmm, all right, you know, there are a bunch of people who are over 40 who are laid off, but there are a bunch of people under 40 who are laid off. It seems reasonable, nothing screams out at me. Um, so if you forget to do that, you can still get a release on all the other claims, but unfortunately, if that person wants to turn around and file an age discrimination lawsuit, they can. You essentially just funded their age discrimination lawsuit by paying them the severance. So that's how that works. Fortunately, that doesn't come up too much, but when it does, oof, it stinks, especially for the law firm that drafts the uh, settlement. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. Um, other forms of stereotyping, we talked a little bit about COVID as a regarded as disability. So you don't have any obligation to accommodate someone whom you regard as disabled, but usually this would crop up more in the disparate treatment. You know, you treat someone not as well who has COVID, even if it's not technically a disability. Whether you're even thinking about it in the ADA context, doesn't matter the plaintiff's lawyer will be. So it will be a claim, a regard, you, you, you treated this person differently because you regarded COVID as a disability. I've already seen it a bunch of times. Um, and then, you know, the, we talked about this last week uh, with May, uh, 
Ortiz, who was who was on, and, and we talked about discrimination against the uh, Asian American Pacific Islander community, um, stereotyping, like that stuff is is just it, it's zero tolerance for that crap in the workplace, whether it happens at work or it's happening remotely by email, that kind of stuff. I, you got to take those types of complaints about discrimination um, against your 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 Asian employees, Asian American employees, very seriously, uh, because that, that can't that can't be allowed to persist. Um, we talked about leave rights, so I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that for now. Unless Lori, are there any anything you want to talk about with leave rights that we haven't talked about any already to close the loop? I think just what we mentioned amongst ourselves earlier is um, the mistake that some employers are making with individuals who are on FMLA when they institute furlough issues and end up counting um, their furlough as part of the individual's FMLA leave. That's a real no-no, please don't do that. Oh, and, then, and then document it too. Yeah, folks, if people are on furlough, don't deduct from their FMLA bank. All right, they're on furlough. That's it. Um, and make sure if you're using a third party processor of your leave policies, you have to monitor that, right, Eric? I mean, absolutely. you know, you can't just say, you know, we left it to this third party um, because the third party is your agent when you're sending the letter to the employee saying, you've now exhausted your 12 weeks of FMLA and if we don't hear from you by such and such a date you know you will be terminated yeah and then that happens yeah yeah the flip side of that is uh sorry to be a cynic here don't have complete blind trust in your employees that they're using their FMLA for its intended purpose especially during remote working times okay I, I blogged about this a couple weeks ago a case involving Yelp uh, which I think came out of it came out of the Seventh Circuit, if I remember correctly, where we had an employee who was whose vacation request to go to Thailand was turned down. Then she applied for FMLA for a bad back. It was granted, and then during her FMLA, she took a transatlantic flight to Thailand. Go figure. Um, the employer naturally assumed that there was some FMLA abuse going on here, and they fired her. All it takes, folks, is an honest belief. And you can terminate someone who is on FMLA now. You should probably investigate it and not just knee jerk. But yeah, FMLA abuse uh, is, this could be a, a situation that is rife with FMLA abuse when we have people who are working remotely to begin with. Although hopefully, because people are working remotely, you're more accommodative and able to work with them. Um, so maybe FMLA doesn't come into play as much. Well, the big R, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, Lori, which is the big one, the, 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 by far the biggest charge of discrimination every year. Uh, we haven't talked about retaliation. And I'm thinking about retaliation, Lori, in the context of whistleblower claims. Something that, uh, for my folks here who are attending and sitting in the Garden State, are very familiar with whistleblower claims, at least anecdotally. Um, California, probably the same way. Certain states have very robust whistleblower laws, but we are seeing now an explosion of whistleblower type claims. Even if you don't have a state statute that governs whistleblowing, almost as, a, as an exception to the at-will employment doctrine, right? You can, someone says, I've complained about unsafe working conditions, Lori, and then they're fired. I've seen courts recognize this as an exception to at-will employment. Are you seeing stuff like that as well? But that particular safety in the workplace is one of the exceptions um, under Illinois law where the Supreme Court has you know, been um, much more liberal in, you know, yeah. upholding um, the denial of motions to dismiss and allowing the claims to go forward. And in Illinois, actually, the courts have ruled that OSHA doesn't preempt those types of um, 
claims. So you can bring both um, the state law claim as well as an OSHA claim. And uh, I think what we're seeing, at least based on the OSHA.gov website, is that um, there's going to be a lot more enforcement um, of those issues under the current administration. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Lori. Uh, OSHA, part of the DOL, um, EEOC, their budgets under this administration, they're expanding. Uh, the number of investigators blowing up. There is a much greater emphasis on litigation versus mit litigation and investigation versus mitigation, right? So whereas in the past, we got opinion letters from the DOL, we got opinion letters from the EEOC telling employers, oh, here's what you can and can't do. And here's some steps you can take to be safe. Uh -uh. That's going out the window for the next couple of years, for the foreseeable future. Um, we're already seeing this with the DOL taking the position now that if you wanna settle a wage and hour claim with us, you're paying liquidated damages too, right? You're not just paying the back wages that you owe, you're paying that times two back wages plus another, the same amount in liquidated damages. It's the way it is. That's that's what happens during a generally, you know, not to make this political, but it's it just as a fact. When it's a Democrat in, in the White House, that's what happens. Republic in the White House, maybe not so much. Um, but yeah, we're seeing much more vigilance from administrative agencies. I would think too, Lori, um, and, and jurors in terms of their level of sympathy for the plaintiff, I would think a claim of retaliation based on unsafe working conditions, that's about as sympathetic as a jury is gonna get, unless that person's in the military too, right? You know, a veteran who is complaining about unsafe working conditions in the workplace. But that's a case I would never wanna try as defense counsel. And I'll delete this if I end up having to try one of these, but <laughs> uh, right now, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't look forward to trying one of those. Do you agree? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So folks, we are at about 1250, so 1248 on my computer. Uh, if you have questions, we left some time for Q and A. You, you've got a plaintiff's lawyer here, right? You can use a pseudonym if you want. We assume your name is not really your name. Ask questions. Ask her, you know, what, you know, ways that you can help yourself or, you know, the types of stuff that she's looking for to, to, to claims to assert. Gosh, I can't even talk right now. Uh, we do have a question from Terry, Lori. Terry asks, are you seeing more claims with GINA, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, due to the pandemic and vaccinations? So GINA, to, for folks that might not be familiar, it's, uh, relatively recent federal law that makes it unlawful to effectively intentionally inquire into one's genetic information, family, medical history, things like that. Uh, Laura, you seen more claims from Gina? I haven't been getting calls about it, but I think, you know, certainly the EEOC has its antennas up on those types of claims or employers asking about, you know, whether or not anyone else in your family or household have contracted COVID-19, yeah, those are gonna be real no-nos. Yeah, it's, it stood out to some people on the latest EEOC, EEOC fiscal year report because amidst COVID and the EEOC not working at full capacity and things are just generally a little slower. I mean, the number of total claims was down, uh, retaliation was down, race was down. I think disability was up, you know, fractionally, but Gina had doubled from like 150 claims to 300 claims, but we're talking out of like tens of thousands of total claims. So Gina still has a ways to go before it, uh, it, it, it registers and, and becomes a significant part of the EEOC's uh, caseload. But yeah, I mean, it, it's something certainly to be careful about and I think we will see more lawsuits related to vaccinations. 
specifically relating that failure to accommodate is the, is the easiest one, right? Um, someone who comes in with a disability and says, can't do it. And you get some over eager employer and says, you have to do it. It's mandatory. Didn't you read the sign? Didn't you read the policy? It's mandatory. We're not, no exceptions. Or my religion doesn't allow me to, to get the COVID vaccination. Therefore, is there something else, you know, a mask, social distancing, remote work, whatever. Um, yeah, these types of claims will certainly pop up. Um, the other types which are being litigated and we've talked about before on these on these Zoom happy hours is you know whether an employer can actually mandate the use or mandate vaccinations for what is now an emergency use authorization vaccination. Uh, two cases that I'm aware of that are pending, one in New Mexico in federal court involving a public employer at detention center, one in California involving the Los Angeles public school system. We'll see how those shake out. I suspect that those claims will be mooted once the FDA authorizes this vaccination for something more than emergency use. Um, but you know, we may see other lawsuits uh, filed uh, in, in the interim. What other questions do we have from our audience? Uh, here we go. Beth asks, what are your thoughts, Lori? She didn't say Lori, but I'm, I'm saying Lori. What are your <laughs> thoughts on how long someone should wait to rehire after a reduction in force or a layoff? Is there some kind of magic number that we should- Four months. <laughs> I'm gonna say? Four months. Four months, there you have it. Four months, write it down. <laughs> <laughs> how long, Lori, is a leave a reasonable for how long is leave a reasonable accommodation? Do you have that number too? Because I'm sure everyone would love to know that. It's in four months. Well, yeah, here in the Seventh Circuit, you know, beyond the FMLA, okay. there's you know, there's some hint that maybe a few days, a couple of weeks. Um, but beyond that, we don't seem to be getting much guidance. And there, you know, again, the there's just been this general hostility to um, allow employees to get away with not reporting for work like everyone else. That's the Judge Sykes opinion, right? In the concrete case where, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> where basically for, for those who aren't familiar, which is like everyone except for Lori and I, um, or if you operate in, this, in the Seventh Circuit. So we're talking about Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, who am I forgetting? That's it, right? That's it. Um, Judge Diane Sykes, as part of a three-judge panel, concluded that if someone takes FMLA and they take their 12 weeks, then the ADA does not require any additional any additional leave as an accommodation beyond potentially days or a few weeks. Definitely not months. Definitely not months beyond the three months of. 12 weeks of FMLA. The logic there, not everyone subscribes to this logic, I do, um, is that FMLA is a leave statute and the ADA is not a leave statute. The ADA is an accommodation statute to get people to work. So leave is kind of antithetical to that. So anyway, right. um, that's but what's going on. I think that it's worth mentioning. Oh. Or, oh, I think they are know. looking for cases where they can challenge it. And I think that employers also need to be concerned about situations where you have allowed individuals who are not disabled, who are not on some type of an FMLA leave to have some type of a leave of absence from work um, you know, unrelated to a disability um, that someone could attack as being discriminatory. That is such a fantastic point um, that sometimes we get caught up in, as, as employers, we get caught up in looking at a particular situation with blinders on, right? This employee right in front of me is asking for three additional weeks off from work. I don't know, that seems kind of rough. Like we shouldn't do that. But then you forget that you just gave three other employees, a three week vacation they asked for without any sort of pushback, right? Now you've got an ADA claim. Now, yeah, so you can't look at one employee 
in, in, in a vacuum, right? We make these accommodation decisions on a case by case basis, but there is a holistic element to it. Is that the right word? There is a, a, a global element to it where, <laughs> holistic, global element to it where we, we can't forget what we've done for other people who, have, who don't have disabilities. Um, other, we have about four minutes left. God, you guys are quiet today. This is unbelievable. I told I told I told Lori that this would be like a flood of questions. We're getting we're getting not much. Maybe they're saving them up. No offense, Lori. They're saving them for next week. Next week, Lori, we're doing Cobra. Cobra. Well, bev what do we call it? Beverages and benefits. So people can show up with whatever beverage they want. I'll have you know something in a can. Maybe not this tea, but something else. And uh, we're going to talk Cobra under the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, and the model notices and all that kind of stuff for, for an hour, stuff that I'm glad I can bring in my colleagues and have them be intelligent and talk about it, but, you know, potentially an adult beverage. But yeah, they're, they're quite, quite, quiet audience today. Lawyers like to talk. Zoom just kicked my butt there. It, not, it locked me off there for a second. Sorry about that, folks. I'm still here. I didn't leave. I'm still here. We're still recording. I apologize. Um, I think that's a good cue to probably wrap this up. Um, <laughs> Lori, thank you so much for your time and being so generous with it this week. I hope our audience, it well, wasn't confused about me just kind of zooming away there for a second, I'm back, but I hope our, enjoy, I think our, our audience enjoyed this. Um, any plugs you wanna do? Any, anything you wanna say to our, to our uh, wonderful HR audience here? think carefully about the inquiries and the requests that your employees are making and um, be one of those people who the pandemic has. Well, folks, I, I don't know if you can hear me or not. My internet connection all of a sudden has gone crazy. Um, I'm gonna try and wrap this up. I'm gonna say thank you to everyone who's still with us. I apologize for the technical difficulties at the end. So I might as well ask if you see this on YouTube to like and subscribe, <laughs> notwithstanding our technical difficulties. But thank you so much to Lori Ecker for being here today. I really appreciate her and her time. Thank you to all of you. We will be back next week. Beverages and benefits on the 23rd. Otherwise folks, stay safe. Have a great weekend and uh, bye for now. <laughs>